What we really want is a level playing field, so it doesn't matter if you're an incumbent or a challenger, and it doesn't matter if you belong to a party or you're an independent. I mean, all things considered, we have a lot to be grateful for here in Australia, but there's still plenty more that could be done. One for mum, one for dad, and one for the country. And there has never been a more exciting time to be an Australian. Budgets are about choices, Fran, and you show what you value through the choices you make. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't treasurer. be scared. Don't the treasurer knows. I want an economy that works for people, not the other way around. We'll just end up being a third-rate economy in a banana republic. Just follow the money. G'day, and welcome to Follow the Money, the Australia Institute's podcast that explains economics, politics, and policy in plain English. I'm your host, Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute. And around the world, democracy is under serious pressure. Across the world, democracy is backsliding. Second Trump term could mean the end of American democracy as we know it. And I, I don't say that lightly. He's willing to sacrifice our democracy. Put himself in power. You have autocrats and you have far-right governments and far-right parties that are well-established in Europe now. Now there is no balance of power in Hungary. The system has been turned inside out and transformed from an electoral democracy into a competitive authoritarian regime. Democracy is gasping for air right now. It is being strengthened. While in many ways Australia has fared better than others, the future of our democracy shouldn't be taken for granted. And how election campaigns are funded and what that money is spent on is a particularly murky part of any democracy. Too often, the public isn't made aware of huge sums of money that flow into our political system, but it doesn't have to be that way. Political finance laws have a big impact on how democracies function. And the federal government is currently considering a suite of electoral and political finance reforms that could change our democracy for the foreseeable future. Bill Brown is director of our Democracy and Accountability Program and one of the country's leading voices on political finance reform. And he's with me in the studio today to talk about it. G'day, Bill. Hey, Ed. So I want to begin with political finance rules in general. Why do parliaments look at this and what are some of the concerns that people should be thinking about when we're talking about this issue? Election campaigns cost money. And one of the main ways that parties and candidates communicate to the public is by running advertisements, opening offices, flyering and letterboxing communities. So we need money as part of our political system. But the concern is that when you have parties and candidates taking money from vested interests, from wealthy donors, and so on, it creates the risk that the parties and candidates will be influenced by the people they're taking money from. For decades then, in Australia, we've seen different attempts to regulate and expose political finance so that Australians get a better sense of who's funding parties and candidates, and can be confident that it's not skewing democratic outcomes. Australians have the right to know who's funding Australians' political parties, even if the parties don't want them to. It is no wonder that the Australian community are saying enough is enough. We have senators of this place who couldn't wait to get out of the joint so they could start spruiking for the gambling industry. We're finding this out eight months after the election is done and dusted, and yet we're talking transparency. This is great. Yeah, because here I guess what we're talking about is, you know, that concern, as you said, that donations are kind of swaying politicians in the parliament is kind of the primary concern. And the way that that manifests is people um, demanding or requesting things like disclosure, real-time disclosure of donations, banning certain types of organisations or companies from, from donating. Those kinds of things come up. When we talk about reforms, are those some of the specific things that that people think about as compared to parliament and what parliament does? There's a large focus from the public on political donations and their influence, as you say. I think there's been less attention given to the spending side of the equation, what the parties and candidates are spending their money on. Australia has donation transparency laws, so large donations have to be disclosed. Um, But as you hinted at there, we don't have real-time disclosure. You can be waiting 18 months before you find out about a political donation. And the threshold for disclosure is so high 
that there's a, a donation of $10,000, for example, doesn't need to be disclosed. And that's enough money to get you dinner with a prime minister. So it's not a small amount of money we're talking about. And the government, led by the Special Minister of State, Don Farrell, is working on a suite of reforms to political donations at the moment. Do we know what's potentially in that package? We only have a limited sense of what the Albanese government is planning to do. We haven't seen legislation proposed in Parliament that would give us the nitty gritty. Um, But we can be guided by what's in the Labor Party platform as well as what a parliamentary committee that looked at this issue last year concluded in its report. Uh, It seems likely that we'll see stricter transparency rules, so we find out about more donations and find out about them faster. We're also expecting the package to include donation caps, so a limit on how much any person or organisation can donate to a single candidate, Um, and spending caps, so limits on how much a a candidate can spend on their own election campaign. We're also expecting to see truth in political advertising laws modelled on those in place in South Australia. Um, Don Farrell's from South Australia himself, and we know that that's the model that he's thinking about. Mm. And, of course, we know voters are very concerned about growing misinformation and disinformation through things like social media, and I would think particularly where parties are receiving public funding and candidates are receiving public funding. Got to make sure they're not putting lies in their political (laughs) ads. But, you know, you talked about spending caps and donation caps there. That kind of regulation Sounds very sensible on the face of it, but are there any risks that come along with that? There are substantial risks. As with a lot of electoral law, the devil is really in the detail here. What we find with donation caps is that they represent a greater restriction on those who depend on donations than those who are already publicly funded. So a new entrant into politics who has to start from scratch it needs to raise more money than a major party that already gets public funding, has accumulated assets over many years, and has many MPs who can help each other out with campaigning. And if that sounds like an outlandish conspiracy to entrench our two-party duopoly forever, just remember that's exactly what happened in Victoria. Hello, I'm from the Victorian Government, where we used to have three independents in Parliament. But then we increased public funding for ourselves and capped everyone else's revenue. And not only were no newcomers elected at the last election, we even got rid of the independents we did have. Amazing. Thanks for showing us the way, Victoria. We need- so a donation cap can end up limiting new entrants. And that's even before you get to questions about how you implement such a cap. We've seen in Victoria that exceptions to the donation caps have actually ended up concentrating political power more so that, for example, you get more money going to the Labor Party from its own MPs and staffers who are uncapped in their levies than you do from the rest of the public in Victoria. Mm, So it can have quite perverse outcomes there. And as he was saying, you know, if we're talking about the strength of our democracy and we want the parliament to reflect the, the, the wider public in Australia, the risk is if we do this poorly that we could end up concentrating power and resources with those people who are already in parliament and kind of making it more difficult for people who want to stick up their hand as a new independent or start a new political party. Is that accurate? That's right. What we really want is a level playing field. So it doesn't matter if you're an incumbent or a challenger, and it doesn't matter if you belong to a party or you're an independent, all candidates can be assessed on their own merits. And often that's the way that these political finance changes are promoted, uh, that they level the playing field. But in practice, what we find is that's not necessarily the case. Mm. And something to really look out for, I guess, because, yeah, as you say, like it sounds very sensible to have a donation cap to me on the face of it, but that's until you think about, well, you know, yeah, if I'm coming new into parliament, then then what happens to, to those people and are they already kind of running at a disadvantage essentially? So, yeah, that level playing field is very important. Tonight I announce that we seek to ban all political donations, full stop. Business, unions, they're all out. Because we want uh, elections to best represent the people's interests 
We've seen the South Australian government propose some pretty big reforms there. How do they stack up against that kind of concern about concentrating power and advantage with incumbent political parties? It's early days yet, and we haven't completed our analysis of the proposed changes, but there's certainly reason to be concerned. Premier Malinowskis has proposed an ambitious package, including banning donations to established parties and members of parliament, and limiting the amount that can be spent on election campaigns even further. If that works, then it would be a template for getting vested interest money out of politics elsewhere. But from an early look at the laws, it doesn't seem like they account for the smaller parties that might be in play who aren't going to benefit from the kinds of generous public funding that the legislation would introduce in order to compensate the major parties for the money they miss out on. And would also set a high bar for new entrants who would be eligible for donations, there's an exception in the law for them, uh, but would have to collect those donations from many different donors because of the donation cap that's in place. So what we're talking about is a change that would free the major parties from having to fundraise at all, while making it harder for new entrants to fundraise. And that's a, a difficult proposition to balance. Yeah. Because we often think of things in terms of just the established parties. So, you know, the the major parties, the, the Liberal Party, the Labor Party, the Nationals, the Greens have now been in Parliament for a long time. And if we think about new entrants who've come in, I guess that was Clive Palmer back in the day, but also now we're talking about people like Jackie Lambie, like a lot of the independent candidates like Helen Haynes and the the so-called teal independence or the community independence that cared a lot about climate change and integrity at the last election. Those are the kinds of people that potentially political finance reforms done poorly could be keeping out. If people kind of want to imagine who it is that we're, we're talking about and in what situations this would apply, would that be roughly right? That's right. Yes, what we see is that uh, it's those independents and those new minor parties that have the most to lose from electoral law changes that aren't carefully considered and well balanced. That said, it's not limited just to new entrants who could be disadvantaged. Imagine, for example, you're a major party MP who's defending his or her seat against several different challenges, a spending cap that applies per candidate actually means you spending less money than those coming for your seat. Mm. Where it gets complicated is, uh, for example, a Liberal who's defending their seat against a Labor candidate and a National candidate (laughs) who might end up pincered from both sides. So while it's the major parties that make the rules of our electoral laws, and so we have a careful eye on how they may be changing things to their own benefit, these laws can end up holding back major party candidates as well. As well. And how do we ensure that there is a a level playing field? How would you account for that differential between an established party or candidate and and a newcomer? The Australia Institute's outlined nine principles for fair political finance reform, which at their heart break down into two areas, that we want a level playing field for all competitors in an election, And secondly, we want the government's response to be proportionate to the threat involved. So it might be quite appropriate to have stricter limitations on donations from the tobacco industry or the fossil fuel industry than, for example, on a bequest from a rusted on member of a political party. Mm. Um, So while there's still a lot of debate and exploration that needs to be had, there are places we can look for fairer ways of funding our political parties Uh, and ways of accounting for incumbency benefits. In the city of Seattle, for example, they have public funding, but they do it via a voucher system, which gives the contribution of every person on the electoral roll the same weight. That gets around the problem we have with public funding here, where because it's based on your previous election results, a new entrant doesn't have any results that they can get funded on the basis of. Mm. Uh, And similarly, You could design spending caps so that they account for the fact that a new entrant has to spend more money. Some jurisdictions gesture at that, 
But to my knowledge, they never actually did the calculations of what quantum of money would actually be required to make it a fair fight. Mm. So, Bill, you've talked a little bit about donation caps and we've kind of touched on, I think, you know, you talked about the fact that we might want to ban donations from certain types of organisations like tobacco, you know, New South Wales has banned, I think, property developers in the past. But tell me a little bit more about spending caps. How do they work? Mm. There's a few models for spending caps around Australia, but basically what they do is limit how much a candidate or party can spend on an election campaign. It might be $100,000 per seat, for example. Uh, Some of them even try and limit the spending of third parties, whether that's companies or trade unions or civil society groups. Uh, The danger uh, appears for spending caps where a major party can effectively pile in its spending on a few target seats in a way that an independent candidate or a minor party cannot. So, for example, if there's a a lower house campaign and an upper house campaign, you could spend up to your cap in the lower house campaign and spend some of your upper house campaign money with a separate cap on those target seats. Major parties also benefit from the synergies that someone who works in one electorate but uh, lives in another will be seeing the advertisements for both candidates from that Mm. party in their one daily commute. In practice, what this means is that independent candidates might need a quite a bit higher spending cap to account for all the the synergies and the piling in benefits that major parties get. Mm. So, Bill, political finance reforms is one thing. There's also kind of, I guess, wider electoral and democratic reforms. And Australia's got a pretty proud history in this respect. What are some examples of things that Australia has done particularly well? In proposing the South Australian donation cap, Premier Malinowskis was actually at pains to emphasise not just Australia's electoral tradition, but South Australia's in particular. Uh, And we see emanating from the states and territories and the federal level a lot of innovations that have gone further. Even the idea of having an independent electoral commission that sticks around between elections was something that had to be invented. Um, The way we cast votes that we take for granted, that you go into a polling booth, you write on a slip of paper that's been provided by the electoral commission and secretly cast that vote, comes out of South Australian innovations before federation occurred. And the secret ballot is sometimes known overseas as the Australian ballot. That's right. It was such an innovation that you wouldn't take a slip of paper from a a person handing it out from a a party and stick that into a ballot. It would actually get something provided to you independently. And even today, we see the boundaries of electorates getting redrawn to political benefit in other parts of the world, whereas in Australia – That responsibility is given to an independent committee, including the electoral commissioner, to make sure that those boundaries, they may advantage or disadvantage one party, but it's being done in a neutral way, not to partisan advantage. Yeah, and I think this is really interesting because I've um, I've been to the United States and, and talked to some people about how their system works. And so if you want to see how a system can be managed really poorly and the virtue, I, I don't think Australians really understand what an enormous, um, enormously beneficial democratic institution our independent electoral commissions are. So in the United States, there is no such thing as an independent electoral commission. The rules are drawn up sometimes on a county by county basis, and they can be full of political partisan appointments to those roles. So you're not necessarily talking all the time about people who are just going to enforce the law impartially or be in charge of redistricting, which sounds like the most boring thing possible. Like, which electorate am I going to be in? You know, people's eyes glaze over. But in the United States, gerrymandering had led to things like two chunks of population connected only by a highway that reinsures that the incumbent gets re-elected every single time because the voters, his voters live in those two bits, even if that doesn't make any sense whatsoever 
on a map. So it looks like a barbell, essentially, like two chunks of voters. And that's essentially what the AEC and our other electoral um, commissions help Australia avoid. It's just, it's so critical to a healthy democracy. And it's the kind of thing we take for granted. And even voting being a relatively painless and pleasant experience where you might be in and out in 15 minutes rather than having to queue up for hours and have in the back of your head the thought that that might have been deliberately engineered to encourage you to go home and not vote at all. Those are things that we avoid in Australia. Another example is the way that preferential voting means that the vast majority of the time you can just go in and literally number the candidates according to who you actually want to get elected. Even the preferential voting system that we have here in Australia uh, makes the process of voting easier. In most cases, you can number your ballot exactly in order of how you actually want candidates to get elected. The UK is going to an election this Thursday, and their first-past-the-post system means that you have to be weighing up which candidate is most likely to get the most number of votes. If you support the Liberal Democrats, you might end up voting for a Labor candidate because that candidate has a better chance of election, or vice versa. Or you'll go into the ballot box not knowing which of those is true, not knowing how best to cast your vote. Yeah, and it ensures that essentially you can always vote for your first preference, but you can express a choice in a three-cornered contest like you were talking about before you know, if you'd rather one candidate get up over the other, if yours doesn't succeed, you haven't wasted your vote, which is what a first-past-the-post system essentially ensures. There's whole chunks of voters who their vote just doesn't count anymore once their person doesn't get elected. We don't we don't have that in Australia, and that's another thing we kind of end up taking for granted, I think, along the lines of uh, that we do similarly with compulsory voting. And we can see in the United States and to a certain extent in a lot of other countries where that means people who aren't motivated to vote or for whom it's difficult, like you said, don't turn out and it can really shape the outcome of elections. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all things considered, we have a lot to be grateful for here in Australia, but there's still plenty more that could be done to reveal how our political finance system works Uh, who's getting money and from whom that money's coming from and make more transparent the way our government operates. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, we want to protect what we've got and we want to make it even better. There's always room for improvement. (laughs) No time to rest on our laurels, particularly when we can see, you know, the damage that's been wrought in countries like the United States. Well, I think that's all we've got time for. Thanks, Bill. Thanks a lot for having me. We'd love to hear your thoughts on the show today and you can reach out to us via email at podcasts at australiainstitute.org.au or you can find us on X or Twitter, as I still call it, at the Oz Institute. That's with an A-U-S. Our theme music is by Jonathan McFeet from Pulse and Thrum with additional music from Blue Dot Sessions. And just a reminder, Dr. Emma Shortis's new podcast series, After America, is out now. In the first episode, Emma reflected on the disastrous first debate and the release of Julian Assange before speaking to former US correspondent for the BBC, Nick Bryant. You can find it wherever you normally get your podcasts. I'm Ebony Bennett. Thanks for listening. 